Hi, everybody. David Knorr back with you for another episode of the Curve Benders Live. I'm elated to be joined by two gentlemen I met a few years ago that I've admired from a distance. And, and thankfully, more recently, we've got a chance to get to know each other a lot better. I want to welcome Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove, the co-founders of Thinkers 50. Hello, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> It's, it's good to be with you both. You're based out of London and uh, we're live on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Uh, for our audience, we recorded a podcast this morning and the title of it is From Ideas to Impact. We'll jump more into that in a second, but I would encourage you to jump in with questions, comments uh, of these two visionary founders and we'll talk more about Thinkers50 and, and all that they're up to. But let me, Stuart, let me start with you. Could you briefly talk about a little about your background? Kind of where did you uh, professionally, kind of what were you doing, the background, and where did the ideas kind of for Thinkers 50 come from? Uh, our background, Des and I's background is actually very similar. Uh, we started off life as uh, business journalists. We didn't really start off life as business journalists, I guess. <laughs> a business well, journalist. Right? Before, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure my mother was. <laughs> oh, look, he's a business oh, journalist. Look, he's a journalist. <laughs> what, a, what a disappointment to us all. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, 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 we were making a living as business journalists when we, when we were adults. Uh, we started writing more, more closely together. We wrote articles together. We wrote a column for the Time, Times of London, contributed to publications throughout the world. We were con contributing editors to the American magazine Strategy and Business. Uh, then we got, got involved in writing books, and then we started helping other people write books. And we realized just how many books were out there and how many ideas were out there, how many tools, how many conferences. It was just a constant stream of a deluge of ideas coming at uh, business people. So we thought we'd try and make sense of it. Uh, and I think, uh, so we knew the, the value of a ranking from our, from our work as journalists. People always love rankings because it makes sense. It makes sense to the world. You can see why you, you like that because it makes sense of the world. And the world of business ideas is very uh, confusing. And so that's how we came up with the idea of the Thinkers 50, a ranking of the 50 most important management thinkers in the world, which was published for the first time in 2001. And we've published it every two years since, since then. So in November of this year, we'll be publishing the latest Thinkers 50 ranking of the world's leading management thinkers. Love it. So Des, I have to ask, did Stuart come to you with this idea? Did you go to him? And what was your initial thought of, wait, you want to do what? You want to rank a whole bunch of thinkers and what are we going to do with that give me a little glimpse into the early early di dialogue around this idea the 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 actual you know the, the question of, of where the where the spark came from has been debated over the years <laughs> but i can assure you that it was my idea no <laughs> we were we were actually in a in a in a italian restaurant and um, with some other journalists and we were everybody was around the table looking for some some new idea to launch um, to get some attention for a startup. And I believe, this is my version, I, I thought about it and said, no one's ever ranked the management gurus. And then Stuart, quick as a flash, said, we could call it Thinkers 50. So the two things came together in a sort of a harmonious, serendipitous sort of way. And um, the idea kind of was created in, in that moment. So um, our mission has been ever since to um, be the world's most reliable resource for identifying ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age the ranking is just one part of that now we we have our sort of gold standard awards which um, the financial times very helpfully has called the um, oscars of management thinking and you know you've attended you've attended the gala every two years we get together and um have sort of davos in the daytime and then the oscars in the evening so um yeah it's been a it's been a fantastic journey and, and, I, and I got it for our audience. I did. I, I, I attended 2017 and again, 2019 in person. And not only it's held at an amazing place and you wear, you know, the gala, you wear black ties and we all look very sharp. But as, as Des alluded to, during the day, there's just some fabulous conversation. So Des, uh, let, let, me, let me build on that for a second. In terms of the, the Davos format for the day and getting... You know, again, I, I'm in. I'm still starstruck when you show up and you see Hal Gregerson and Roger Martin and and you know Amy Edmondson and a lot of these people you read about in very prominent publications. 
they're there. Why do you believe they come? Why do you believe they value in bringing their prominence, their work to a gathering like Thinkers 50? I think we we were as sort of um, in awe as, as as possibly you were the first time it happened. I mean, I didn't. I don't think we fully understood the convening power of this thing that we 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 created. Um, and, and and then there's a sense of community, and I think that's what that's what draws people in. I think people because we always hold it in London. We've always held it in London, so people have to you know all these very famous management um, thinkers cross the Atlantic to come to the event. They, they pay their own expenses. Nobody gets paid a fee. And they, they just want to be part of the community, I think. And I think that's that's been the secret of it. They feel like they're part of something. Maybe there wasn't a sense of community before we started doing this in terms of, you know, where, where are you going to go and hang out with all the people who are, who are having the same sort of ideas? You've got to remember, too, that they, they rock it around the world, but they don't often get a chance to catch up with each other. Mm. So, Stuart, build on that. You, you, I really appreciated your comment in our podcast interview when I asked you the methodology of, I mean, there's, I, I read a statistic that said something like 3,000 business books are published every month. And it just becomes overwhelming of just like idea overload. You have a really interesting methodology where you evaluate kind of who gets on, on your proverbial radar. Yeah, so people can go visit our website, thinkers50.com, and nominate thinkers. And, and that's been an impo important part of the process since, since the very start. Because it's, I mean, what, what's really changed in the 20 years we've been doing this is that ideas have become truly global. In, in the first ranking, the, virtually everyone was American on the list because American business schools dominated the world of management ideas. And obviously, they're, they're still hugely influential, but the list has become much more more global, and it's very difficult uh, to keep up to date in any practical way with what's coming out throughout the world. So we have ten criteria. We have got basically got two axes we uh, measure people against. One is viability, how practical are, are their ideas, and that's that's a really big deal for us. And I think we've always emphasised that. There's no point, uh, obscure academic research doesn't really in interest us. What interests us is ideas that actually affect people in the workplace. So on one axis is viability, and on the other axis is visibility. It's no good having uh, great ideas if, if nobody's ever heard of you, or you don't get them out into the world. And visibility is all about things like uh, influence and social media process and, and, and so on. So, that, so that's how we measure that. Um, but people have an input on, we also, every year we publish the Thinkers 50 radar of 30 up and coming thinkers. And that's people send us nominations throughout the year of people that they think are doing re really interesting work. And we investigate and, re and research each one of them then we receive. And, and we also have our awards, uh, 10 awards, strategy, leadership, innovation, and, and, and so on. And people can be, can be nominated at our website uh, and we, Take take the uh, nominations very very seriously, and we take our short list to a, a group of uh, ad advisors, an anonymous group of advisors. So that's how we do it. Viability and visibility is what we're looking for. Love that. So let me go to our audience. That'll encourage you if uh, you're joining us on LinkedIn or Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter Live. I know a lot of folks will watch the recording of this afterwards, but I'd love to have you jump in with questions or comments for for Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove. So we got one from. Mark Fonseca, in your opinion, Stuart, let me start with, start with you and I'll go to Des next. What do, what do you feel have been the top three contributions uh, of Thinkers 50? So how, how are you with the rankings, with the galas, with, if I understand Mark's question correctly, how do you feel like you create an impact with those both producers of the great ideas, but also the consumers of them? I think we're shining a, a light on important people and important ideas that have the potential to change the world. And I think that's that's the big difference. When we started in, in 2001, the people we featured, and a lot of the research at that time was about um, how you could increase market share by 0.4%, how, how you could increase productivity from a factory. Uh, that sort of thing is I mean, obviously is, is important, but the people we feature on, on the ranking increasingly want to change the world mm -hmm. and they have the ideas which can change the world. So I think by shining a spotlight on those people 
who can uh, help help us tackle some of the world's thorniest problems. I think that's our, our biggest achievement and, be, and, and biggest contribution. Uh, Des, let me let me ask you to build on that. I've always believed people fundamentally gather for two reasons: content and community. Talk you, about the outcome from from Thinkers Fifty. You, you took the words you took the words right out of my mouth because I think our three things are community. We created. We, we it, it sort of happened by chance, really. I think I can't say that we planned it, but we 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 discovered there was a community in waiting, as it were. So community, content, which you mentioned also, but also convening power. Mm. I think getting these people together, I mean, it's one thing to have a community, it's another thing to assemble them and to get them in the same room. And I think that's been the, that that's when the, if I may say so, that's when the magic happens. When you get all these people, I mean, as I say, you've, you've experienced it. When you get these people in the same room and they start sparking off each other and you've got, you've got all that intellectual horsepower, all that creativity, and you're rubbing shoulders with people whose books you've been studying for, you know, 20 years or, or, or studied in graduate school and they're standing next to you or they're sitting next to you at the next table. I think I think that's part of it, too. I think there's a little bit of, you know, magic dust in that. And, and again, I'm, I'm reminded of this past year. I'm not sure, you know, maybe conceptually people understood Alex Osterwalder's, you know, business model design and canvas mm -hmm. and all that. But we had we had the entire room working on a canvas. I think it gave people a new appreciation for that visual storytelling. The other thing that I distinctly recall is some of, you know, fabulous conversations in the hallways and yeah. during the breaks where you, you know, just chat up with someone and you realize, oh my gosh, they're doing some really interesting things in Oslo or doing some really fascinating things in, in, in Moscow. So Stuart, let's talk about the last 14 months. Can you comment on maybe the top two or three management thinking trends concepts ideas that you believe will have a lasting impact on us in the post pandemic world and des i'm going to come and ask you the same question in a minute yeah i mean the good thing about this field is there's always a constant stream of um, new ideas and people doing interesting things it doesn't actually stand still um the, the, i think there was the the belief in the past that it, that it could stand still um so I think there's lots of there's lots of new ideas out there, and I think the pandemic has really concentrated minds. And uh, I think it's actually been quite a fertile and fruitful time for people to uh, think about how organisations are going to be shaped and how, how they're going to behave in the future. Uh, so some of the ideas that stand out for me, uh, Megan Rates from Ashridge Hult Business School talks about employees as activists. And I think the changing nature of the relationship between employees and organizations, it's, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's been on the agenda for a, a few years with the, the rise of millennials and so on. But the reinvention of the employee as an activist is a, is a big step forward, I think. And there's going to be lots of stuff about the employee experience. There's a guy called Ben Witter who we featured on the Thinkers 50 radar, he talks about the employee experience. And it's all, all really interesting stuff. And the other one I would throw in at, the, at this stage, which I think is a really big idea, is something called cooperative advantage, which comes from a Leon Prieto and, and Simone Phipps, uh, two American academics at uh, Georgia State University and Middle Georgia Uni University. So cooperative advantage. So I would check out the... Um, their article in the MIT Sloan Management Review about cooperative advantage, because I think that's a really novel and different way of looking at the, the world of organizations and, and the world of work in the future. So we've moved from Michael Porter's five forces and competitive advantage to the potential for cooperative advantage, people actually working together. Daz, let me ask you the same trends that you, you're particularly gravitating towards and believe will stay with us on the yeah. other side of the pandemic. Okay, well, following Stuart's sort of paradigm change from 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 um, competitive competition to to uh, collaborative cooperative, um, at the, the 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 people at the top of our ranking at the moment in 2019, Chan Kim and Rene Moburn from INSEAD, their idea of non-disruptive creation, which is so we've had probably a couple of decades now. I mean, the late great Clay Christensen's disruptive innovation has sort of dominated the innovation conversation for for years, for decades. Um, brilliant as it was, 
what what Chan and Rene are now saying is actually you don't necessarily have to destroy markets in order to create value. So I think that's very powerful. Um, their slow management review article, I think, is going to be a be, will be regarded as a kind of landmark, a sea change possibly. They were even kind enough to suggest that Thinkers 50 might be an example of this, where we didn't have to destroy a market in order to create something new. So watch this space. Maybe we'll end up as a case study in one of their books. But um, So that would be one. Um, we were earlier speaking to Matt Bean, who's at the University of California at, at, at um in Santa Barbara and he was saying he's talking about he studies the kind of the um, relationship between humans and technology and, and he was saying you know the, the trouble is the way we're implementing the technology the AI and the robotics means that there's a huge de-skilling process going on and we've got to do something about that we've got to whether it's surgeons no longer learning on the job you know his phrase was it used to be when you were learning to be a surgeon it was see one, do one, teach one. But with the onset of robotic surgery, that's just not happening. And, and you know, we're going to lose, in a generation, we're going to lose a lot of skills. So I think those ideas, bring, uh, emphasizing the, the human um, aspect to, to work and realizing that, you know, humanity is always going to be important. I think that's really important. I um, mean, again, um, another big idea, I think, is brand activism. Stuart mentioned employee activism, but brand activism. Christian Sarka and um, the uh, sort of the, the, the god of marketing, Phil Kotler, are doing a lot of work in that area, and that, that's fascinating as well. So that's that's my three. So thank you both for that. So let me jump in. Uh, Chris Simmons wants to know: Given COVID nineteen disruptors, what are the trends within Thinkers Fifty regarding jump starting recovery? versus really embracing change toward a restart or reimagine or rethink uh, our world in a very different way. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about jump-starting recovery, I think, I think we'd all accept that things are going to be different and we have to think differently. Um, and I think over the last year, I mean, I mentioned cooperative advantage, but I think there's been a greater sense over the last year or 18 months about the power of collaboration uh, and that how we organize ourselves and how organize how organizations are, are structured be much more free flowing and creative so i think there's going to be one thing we're involved with is the business ecosystem alliance which i know you're interested in as well and i think the entire idea of ecosystems that organizations don't live in some isolated uh, context that they need to create powerful ecosystems of customers and suppliers and understand those ecosystems and maximize them. I think that's a really important way forward for the if, we, if we're going to grow beyond the uh, to, to grow beyond the pandemic. So, Des, let me build on that. Uh, one of the fascinating uh, case studies in the last several years and a, and a big highlight at our gathering in 2019 was higher and their CEO and how this Chinese company who bought GE appliances, by the way, has created now these micro enterprises and this incredibly thriving ecosystem. My question of you is, what do you believe this pandemic is going to accelerate more organizations to think of that entrepreneurial, think of that, uh, you know, creating an environment with P&Ls where People have now a common mission or common vision or potentially common enemy to come together and create very different outcomes. I think the notion, I mean, you know, just the, the switching language from very mechanistic language in the 20th century to, to the organic language. Now we're talking about ecosystems. We're not talking about machines anymore. We're talking about ecosystems. Ecosystems, as we know, can recover much more quickly. They, 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 you know, they, they spring to life as soon as they get the right um, conditions. So I think that's a very promising um, and um, encouraging metaphor. But the, the thing, too, that, that um, Zhang Weimin, who's the CEO of Hire, who you mentioned, he talks about, he's got this concept of Renden Hai, and he talks, he talks about the paradigm shift from, if you like, Toyota in the 20th century with zero defects. It's all about efficiency. And, and Renden Hai is all about zero distance. It's about these micro enterprises 
having zero distance from the marketplace, having zero distance from their customers. So it's it's a whole different way of thinking about business. It's very vibrant. Um, I have to say, you know, you don't you don't um, get to make an omelet without breaking some eggs. He he let go twenty thousand middle managers, you know, because he said basically you either set yourselves up as micro enterprises and you create value. We haven't got room anymore for that for that middle management um, fat, if you like. And um, so high and inter interestingly too, of course, um, um, GE appliances is a part of GE or was a part of GE, but that's thriving under, dare I say it, under sort of Chinese management philosophy, um, whereas the rest of GE, as we know, has struggled. So, so Stuart, let me ask you, um, what do you believe it will take? The, the, the executives I work with around this idea of business model innovation, we have a fascinating conversation and I tell them it takes courage, it takes commitment, and it takes a construct. I can't do the first two for you, but if you can muster up the first two, I can bring the construct to help you think and lead differently. My question of you is what do you believe it has to happen for more of the consumers of these management thinking ideas to embrace higher, to embrace evolution of their business model, of their value creation, of their go-to-market strategies to think and lead differently? Yeah, curiosity, I think, has got to be the starting point. Uh, Des mentioned the CEO of Hire, a guy called Zhang Ray Min, uh, who's grown the company from a virtually bankrupt state organization to the biggest white goods manufacturer in the world. And what's noticeable about him is how curious he is, how many books he reads about business. He's read everybody. He's read Henry Mintzberg. He's read Alex Ostervald. He's, he's read everything on, on business because he's interested and, and curious, and he wants to run his organization in better ways. And it's amazing, Des and I have interviewed many CEOs and uh, people in the C-suite, and uh, it, it's staggering how lacking in curiosity about their own discipline they often are. Uh, you don't see, you don't see, go to a CEO's office and find a, a new business book open on his desk. He's been reading it, or that's not really on their uh, on their on their radar, but. How else are they going to change their behavior and change the behavior of their organization if they don't embrace the, the latest thinking? So, so let, me, let me build on that. Why do you believe that's the case? Why, why do you believe that curiosity is missing? Uh, because they think they can go to business school for two weeks and get it and, 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 and get, that, get that certificate and that's enough. But I, I, I don't think it is. And uh, I... I mean, it would be hugely impressive if you meet a CEO who's reading books about biology or leadership or whatever they're reading books about, it suggests a degree of curiosity. I mean, the best leaders we've come across in, in, all, in all spheres are curious about the job, they're curious about people, about curious about the organization. And that's missing in, in many organizations. So you, you brought up a great point, and Mark has got a, a great question. Uh, Daz, I want to start with you. Is there an initiative, or would you like to see an initiative to add thinking classes in colleges and business schools? Why, one of my suppositions is we, we don't – critical thinking, right, is, 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 seems to be a, a, a fast-disappearing discipline. Do you, do you have any examples, ideas, perspectives on – how do we elevate that? How do we create opportunities for those in the spring of their careers to kind of make more time to think and really develop those critical thinking skills? No, I think that's a, that's a real challenge. And I think, I think we, we haven't been particularly good. Business schools haven't been actually as good as they might have been about cultivating reflective thinking. It, it, it's, it's very much driven by... Um, cramming knowledge even you know even at mba level it's still it's still knowledge cramming rather than creating um spaces you know we'd like to we we're, we do some work with um with visiting professors actually at business school in madrid ie business school and um the president of the university there um like santiago he's he, he's very big on the on the kind of humanities and bringing and has tried to bring that through and into very much into the business school um, it's one of Europe's top business schools, by the way, and it was started by an entrepreneur, so it has a real entrepreneurial focus. 
and yet they emphasize along with technology and the things you'd expect you know philosophy you know philosophy is a great is a great subject um, for learning to think but it's it, it's it's not on business school curricula mm. it could it could be and it should be so so Stuart uh, Mark has a follow-up question how, how much time do both of you deliberately set aside time do you think when do you do your best thinking uh, in the morning over a coffee um, no is the is, is the answer uh, because I think you you make opportunities in a kind of more unstructured way I, th I think uh, you encounter opportunities uh, to, to think about ideas I mean I think going back to the, the previous point about business schools I think uh, we referred to somebody we, we, we talked to earlier today actually Matt Matt Bean from the University of California at um, Santa Barbara and his stuff is all about the importance the growing importance of learning at work mm. and the decline in importance of formal learning i.e business schools and I think that's a big trend that's that's going to happen and pe organizations have really got to em embrace it uh, and key to that I think is something like mentoring mentoring is is kind of has been fairly marginalized because coaching is seen as a uh, sexy and we can all understand it whereas mentoring is a bit is is, is a bit more a bit different and uh, there's somebody on our fingers 50 radar this year was Ruth Gottian from Cornell who's an expert on mentoring it's worth checking out her for Forbes articles but I think mentoring is going to going to become much more important uh, in the years to come and in answer to in answer to the question again um, yeah, think, thinking we 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 encounter it during our working days. <laughs> Des, Des, let me ask you to do, uh, answer the same. I think um, I think we're all guilty, perhaps, of of spending too much time doing and not enough time thinking. But I think it, one of the one of the one of the good things that that maybe can come out of the pandemic. And the, I mean, in the UK, we've we've been through a, a series of you know we're just coming out of our third sort of lockdown, but it it has created some thinking space. It's made us, I think, reflect upon what's important. Not least things like um, you know people who just will automatically jump on an aeroplane and assume they've got to go to the various places. I think going forward, we will question whether we you know there'll, there'll still be times when you want to get on an aeroplane and, and, and go somewhere and be there in person. But I think we've learned that's not, we should at least think about that decision. We should at least question, is it is it helpful? Is this really a good use of my time and my resources to be to be going to this place when perhaps, you know, sometimes you can connect using Zoom and other technologies, um, StreamYard in this case. Um, you, you know, um, so I think, I think there are opportunities, pockets for thinking um, if we choose to take them. My fear is, my concern is that we just go full throttle again, um, which is sort of what people tend to do and trying to get back to where we were. Whereas I think we don't want to do it, get back to where we were. We want to do it, learn to do it differently and, and take this moment, this pause to take a breath and thinking is part of that. For our audience, if you've joined us late, you've been listening to Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove, the co-founders of Thinkers 50 based in London. It is uh, by many called the, the, the hybrid of Davos, the World Economic Forum and Oscars of management thinking. Uh, Stuart, in thinking about the last 20 years, what has been the biggest surprise for you in building Thinkers 50, in the rankings, in the events, in really the ecosystem that you've built, and and what has been the the is there is there a highlight like is there if I ask you to I know I'm asking you to name your favorite child but is is there a single highlight that you recall as that was that that was the moment that really stands out? Yeah, there's lot lots of highlights. Um... And the idea has grown over the over the last twenty years. I mean, I think our realization. Uh, I mean, we we I, I was slightly cynical at the start because we're cynical, skeptical journalists, uh, and there was a lot of skepticism between us on the, how important these ideas ideas and thinkers were. And I think the real eye opener for for me and, and I think for Des as well is when we got to know um, C K Pralad uh, better. Uh, CK was uh, number one in our, our ranking on, on two occasions. 
But uh, CK, his, his book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, uh, really opened our eyes to the fact that these are ideas are actually really important, can change the world. Because CK's book um, changed the way people regarded some of the poorest people in the world. And so I think that's the biggest surprise, surprising thing that that we were, our eyes were opened because mm. you kind of expect, you don't really expect your eyes to be opened after a certain age. And uh, and I think that's the, the, the continuing theme. I know some people have commented on that, uh, that the practicality of these ideas is, is the big surprise that our first number one was Peter Drucker, who basically mm. invented modern management. And Peter Drucker was writing about knowledge workers at the end of the 1960s well before they were kind of accepted as a as a fact and then he was followed by michael porter from harvard business school whose five forces framework was a as, as informed how people understand competitiveness and strategy for the last 30, 30 or 40 years and then we had um, clay christensen whose ideas about disruptive innovation the innovators dilemma informed huge number of organizations about how their take on innovation so what really has surprised me and opened my eyes is just the practicality of, all, of all, all these tools and ways of looking at the world. And I think that's what we, we see as our, our role. So Des, let me ask you, biggest surprise in the last 20 years of doing this and, and if there was a highlight? I guess I was, I was initially, I mean, we were professional skeptics because we were journalists, you know, as Stuart says. So we've been on a bit of a, a bit of a journey of discovery ourselves. But um, I was initially surprised at the level of interest in the Thinkers 50. When we first launched it in 2001, um, it, it, it made the front page of a national newspaper in the UK. It must have been a slow news day, I guess. But it was, it, 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 you know, suddenly there it was. Um, and I think, you know, we, we included, perhaps because of the scepticism, we included Dilbert in that first list. And, um, you know, when, when his creator put it up on his on his website and mentioned that he, he was in, Scott Adams, that he was he was in this ranking, the, the amount of traffic that drove to our website melted our website down. We, we just hadn't anticipated all this, all this football would come to our website and that people would be so interested. So I think that was a surprise. But Stuart mentioned... Um, Clay Christensen, and a highlight for me was I remember being in his office at Harvard, and for those of people who were lucky enough to, to spend time with him in his office, he had, a, he had this wonderful sign, and it just said, anomalies welcome. And it's so refreshing to find an academic who'd got this incredibly powerful theory, and he was basically saying, knock it down, guys, you know, let's make it better. Let's, let's improve on my theory. Bring me the anomalies that don't fit my theory. I want to hear about them. That's so refreshing for an academic to have that attitude, to want to find a new paradigm, to want to have that conversation. And Clay was very much of a collaborative mindset, very much wanted people to talk, that the thinkers, the more they talked, the more they could co-create, to use one of CK's terms, you know, better ideas better theories. That's what he was interested in. I, I, now I'll never forget. Uh, I worked with a, uh, an aerospace engineering firm and they had a, a leadership and a board retreat. And I, I Clay was, was, uh, leading that conversation and I was on the agenda next talk about big shoes to follow. Mm -hmm. Number one, number two, I distinctly remember how collaborative he was and he brought very different parts of the organization into the discussion mm -hmm. and, what they walked out with was truly co-created amongst that group, that audience. So uh, you're exactly right. So uh, Stuart, Larry Taylor wants to know, Stuart, I agree with you about curiosity and its value. What do you do, if anything, to stimulate and or keep your curiosity at a high level? Yeah, I mean, I like Larry already and he's agreeing with me, but uh, <laughs> I think curiosity is a necessity to survive as a, as a human being. You think of the old people you, you who live to 90 or 95, they're virtually all curious or interested in other people. Uh, and I think to some extent, uh, journalistic background is actually helpful because you're trained or you develop the ability to ask questions. <laughs> Not, you're not you're not actually trained to come up with any answers, but you you're, you you can come up with questions, which makes life life a lot lot easier. I think so. I think that's the ability to ask questions 
is, is really important. It's part of curiosity. Uh, it's worth actually somebody on our, our ranking currently, Hal Gregerson from MIT, his, his research is all about asking questions, catalytic questions. And I think that's, that's, that's really important. I think that's at the heart of curiosity. And we encounter so many people who aren't actually that curious about uh, how other organizations do things or, or what we're doing or what other people are doing. So I think that's really important. And I think we're going to be tested. Um, we ran a session yesterday with somebody on our radar, radar list who's a, Russian, a young Russian woman who's based in Hong Kong called Ashley Duderennok. Um, don't ask me to pronounce her name again. Um, who's an expert on consumer trends in China. And it's amazing what she was mapping out. She's just published a consumer, a 600 page consumer trends report on what's happening in China. And she was mapping it out for us. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible what's, what's going on there. But the question, the, the, the question there is, are we open to learning from China? Do we have the curiosity? I mean, and my assumption, and it's strange, I would think of myself as moderately curious, but I was looking at it the wrong way around. I was looking at what, what could Western companies bring to China? But it's going to be the other way around. Chinese companies and Chinese technology is going to be go going out to the world. Mm. So I think it's our willingness to be open. For our, audience, if, for our audience, if you never see my name associated with Thinkers 50 again, that'll be a testament to how well the questions from this session <laughs> were of the questionnaires because – these guys do this for a living. So, so Des, let me ask you: How do you how do you elevate? How do you stimulate your sense of curiosity to not just we can all consume interesting concepts, ideas, trends, but really synthesize them and really ask the tough questions that Stuart brought up. That where is this going? Is this viable? Is this really practical or or, or really something that that practitioners can actually implement? I think, um, I mean, I think, I think we sort of stumbled upon, we're, we're very fortunate in the sense that Stuart and I, that we spend our whole time playing with ideas. And I, and I, you know, that is a very, we're very fortunate to be able to do that and to make a living doing it because it, it's a wonderful thing. We get to discover new ideas the whole time, which, which keeps, I think, our sense of curiosity alive. And I'm reminded of um, Charles Handy actually said, he talked about his work and he said, you know, I'm, I'm the honeybee of business. I cross pollinate. It's not that I have particularly original ideas. What I do is I get a little bit from here and I, and I combine it with that and I bring it to that. And he said, that's, that's actually the, the, the proper role of a, of a management guru or a management thinker. Um, we're, we're, we're not the thinkers, but we're sort of one step behind them, sort of carrying their bags maybe, but we get to do the same thing. And I think the, the point about taking ideas from the West to Asia, and but but also bringing them back the other way, and 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 watching ideas travel around the world, and, and just watching the, the way that the ideas economy works mm. is 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 fascinating, and um, you know we're we're very proud to be part of that. So I want to build on that. I know the two of you speak globally. When you're asked to speak, what is that audience most curious about? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to know what, what's the latest ideas, what's going to shape management tomorrow, what's going to shape our organization tomorrow. I think that's that's what people want to know. So, so Des, when you two show up, you know, how do you divide and conquer? Who's going to present what? Well, it depends who you, who you ask the question to first. <laughs> <laughs> the way this one's going, I have to follow in his footsteps and think of something different to say to what he's just said. Um, I... We, we, we um, I think we have complementary um, skills, um, although we, we, we have big overlap as well. I think we, we, we bring slightly different, um, you know, takes to things. Um, uh, so we, we don't so much divide and rule as, as co-create. So we've been talking a lot about the past and your history and your experiences in the last 20 years. I want to change the conversation to kind of thinking ahead. So, Des, I'm going to start with you this time and give Stuart a chance to, to kind of think through this. Give us a glimpse into your vision, your direction. What does Thinkers 50 look like five years from now, 10 years from now? How are you two thinking differently about your own organization and about your value in the market? 
I think I think it's been a you know a fascinating um, eighteen months. I mean, we we had the last ranking and the last gala was at the end of two thousand and nineteen. So we sort of, in a way, dodged the bullet in the sense that that it would have been very difficult to have done that in two thousand and twenty, as we all know, because because of the things that were going on. But so we went into two thousand and twenty sort of buoyed up with the thing we were going to take Thinkers 50 to a different level. We were going to do all sorts of things with it. And then, you know, the world suddenly changed. Um, I think what that taught us was to be a bit more agile, hopefully. Um, but we pivoted at that point. We, we, could have, we could have perhaps just sort of sat back. But what we did, we thought we ought to step into the community and try to, you know, hold the community together and do our bit. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of um, you know, people who make a living from speaking and writing, were, as you well know, sort of becalmed. Their diaries emptied overnight. Suddenly, you know, all these people, all these um, keynote speakers. But that was an opportunity, and we tried to step into that by organising an event we called um, "Reimagine the Future." Um, we we had um, twenty four world class speakers um, speak, you know, over a twenty four hour period. We started in Australia. And we ran this thing kind of around the world following the time zones until we reached California. And I think that was quite a um, formative new experience for us because it took us into the world of webinars. It took us into, into seeing how the community worked when you put them together. And we were, I mean, you know, as I say, people were becalmed. We had Nobel Prize winners. You know, we were able to convene for that, for that event. So... Um, that changed our outlook, and, it, and I think it's created possibly a new future for Thinkers 50. I think we see our role now much more in terms of making that community harm, supporting the community, creating content as well. I mean, 24 hours of content created in 24 hours. It was a, a very um, uplifting experience. We also raised about $200,000 for charitable, you know, for people in the front line. So it was a good experience, but it, a transformative one, I think. I distinctly remember and I thought this is a this is a world class event that is being put on globally by by this organization. Stuart, in our in our podcast conversation this morning, one of the trends that I was fascinated you mentioned was a premium on agility, uh, generosity and the spirit and and this idea of giving and a bigger purpose, bigger impact. Talk about your vision. And that that agility that that Des alluded to in the evolution of Thinkers Fifty moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of our advantages historically is that um, we're a small organisation, so we can respond, we can follow things that uh, interest us, and some things that we think will make money for us. But we can change direction uh, very easily, and uh, which makes work more enjoyable. Mm. And make organizational life more enjoyable and we've seen that the organizations that have done well or, or have survived the pandemic in good health have displayed agi agility humility and, and generosity I, I think uh, so I think anything we can do to um, champion those ideas is, is important I mean I think the humility is something we've encountered quite a lot in the organizations that we admire tend to have a, an air of humility about them and hum, humble leaders. And uh, we did some work in Japan with the um, board of the Japanese company Fujitsu. And what was amazing there was their, their modesty. They were developing the world's fastest supercomputer. It beat the IBM c c competition. But they had a huge modesty and a deep attachment to working closely with customers. So I think those sorts of organizations are really organizations we should all try and emulate. And, uh, and hopefully we can. I, mean, I think our, uh, our modesty and humility is large, largely intact. For our audience, <laughs> for our audience uh, you're listening to Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove, the co-founders of Thinkers50. Uh, I, I can uh, confidently say they come across more management thinking ideas and perspectives than many of us do. And I would encourage you to jump in with your questions of the two of them. We've got one from Carolyn. So Des, I want to make sure equal opportunity. Let me start with you. With increased focus on collaboration, do you see any new trends in how conflict can facilitate collaboration? Is that friction? Is that conflict positive, constructive for moving that, that collaborative idea forward? 
I think I think a little bit of grit in the system can can help. I mean, we 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 talk about um, you know um, creative tension, and I think I think but I think being a bit more grown up about it and having having these conversations and not being not being afraid to discuss it. Um, one of the one of our radar thinkers from 2016 was Erin Meyer. She's just written a book um, with the CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings. Um, no rules, rules. And of course, a big part of the of the Netflix culture is 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 candor. You know, is radical candor and, and really telling people how you know what their strengths and weaknesses are. And I think I think that that potentially, I mean, that's a, that's a hugely creative organisation. Um, and you know, I had the good fortune to spend a couple, a couple of days with Reed Hastings, and he talks very much about you know the paradigm switch from efficiency to flexibility, and, and for, certainly for creative industries. And, and, and he says, you know, um, uh, process too much process kills flexibility. Mm. But within that organisation, there is an incredible um, appetite for honesty. Mm. Now, I'm not saying it's going to it, it's going to work for everybody, but it's a very open culture. It's a very creative culture. It's a very creative industry uh, they're in, um, and it's working for them. So, I, I mean, I thoroughly uh, recommend that book. It's fascinating. And Erin did a fantastic job of excavating what, what it is about the Netflix culture that, that makes it makes it special. I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm just saying it's, if, if you're interested in the kind of the way that people – uh, the tension that can exist in organisations in a powerfully positive way. That's a very good case study, very good example. Uh, Stuart, let me ask you the same, to comment on Carolyn's question, the relationship between conflict and collaboration. Yeah, I don't have much time for conflict. I, I, I don't think it tends, it, it, tends, it tends not to be a very positive experience. But I think there's a need for, as Des says, honest conversations. And I think that's the one thing, if you talk to uh, CEOs in particular, they don't actually have that many honest conversations because uh, inf information and, uh, well, people tell them what they, they think they want to hear. And, and there's a real premium if you're a, a leader of any organization and, and having honest conversations. But with, around that, you've got to create a culture, as, as Des was saying about Netflix, where honest conversations are encouraged and enabled. Uh, Des, we hear a lot about organizations like Netflix, like Amazon, like Tesla, who in some ways were in some advantage because they, they really thrived in, let's say, in the last 20 years. Yeah. For organizations that are, a lot of, I'm thinking of my clients, are mature companies in mature industries that have been around for decades. And you hate to say it, but some of their decorum, some of their uh, mindset, roadmap, maybe tool sets or skill sets are hardwired in. What do, you, what do you believe is really the opportunity for them to embrace some of the lessons from these organizations to try net new growth, net new evolution of their culture, of their talent, hmm. of their value approach? Uh, can, can old dogs learn new tricks? It's kind of it's sort of the question. Um, yeah. I... I Something, something that we witnessed, which, which, we, which I, I think we both found quite striking, was we were in we were in um, China, in Qingdao, which is the where the higher organisation is headquarters, and um, and, and we, were, we were there three four years ago, and the senior management of GE appliances, you know, this is this is the old part, this is GE, this is this is that culture was very strong. They were very sure of themselves. Let's just say. But, but so these these senior executives were brought over to sort of see the higher way, and it's interesting too that higher didn't send an army of executives into GE appliances. They they they, they brought them over, and 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 the CEO of uh, GE appliances, Kevin Nolan, um, you could see him sort of thinking, "Wow, is this is this for real? Is this going to work for us? You know, we're GE," and you could almost see him in in that sort of not quite. Sure, but the next time I saw Kevin, you know that the, the the results talk for themselves. But he he and that organisation have pivoted. They have they have taken on board the the learning points from from this radically different culture. And we're talking about one of America's you know strongest corporate cultures in GE. Um, and they have they have adapted. So I think 
I think traditional companies can learn from from these new ways of thinking if they're open-minded. And Kevin is very open-minded. I, and I wasn't sure when I first saw these guys that they were going to be able to make the transition, but um, but they have. Stuart, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. You made a comment earlier that early on in Thinkers 50 ranking, that the American business schools had a dominant position in ideas, perspectives, and net new approaches to solving large, impactful global challenges. And more recently, it is Thinkers 50 has become much more of a global community and ideas seems to be thriving in, in other markets. Do, do you believe that that American exceptionalism, that American ingenuity is on the decline or simply the ecosystem has gotten stronger in other markets to likewise think differently and bring those really forward thinking ideas to the forefront? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 20 years ago, uh, China and India were emerging markets, um, but no one country, America or any, any other country, has a monopoly on, on, on good ideas. Uh, so some of the, you've got to accept there's some fantastic ideas coming out of um, India, for instance. You look at Navi Raju, who's done work about frugal innovation. It's called Jugad Innovation in India. The fantastic stories of people with hardly any resources coming up with hugely ingenious uh, responses to very uh, big challenges. So no one country has a, a monopoly on, on wisdom. So what we've seen really is the democratization of business ideas of, over the last 20 years, uh, which I think is a good thing. And you've got to say as well that... Um, the leading business schools such as Harvard, Stanford, et cetera, have, have, have embraced this. Their, their teaching is more global than, than ever before. The examples um, they use are, are, are truly global and um, the, their business school professors have all been globalized. And uh, so I think things, uh, things are moving in a, in, a, in a good direction, but you, can't, you, you can never assume that you have a, um, a monopoly on wisdom or best practice. So, and we we do encounter a lot of people who say Silicon Valley is held up as the the entrepreneurial tech center of the world. And obviously, we we all know it's done some fantastic things, and some amazing companies and some fantastic technologies have been produced by Silicon Valley. But it's not perfect. The traffic the traffic is terrible, for instance. But, and it doesn't have a monopoly on wisdom. There's lots of other, other places. For instance, we were in Denmark. We did some events in Denmark, and they've got a robotics cluster, which we, we brought Michael Porter over to, to Denmark, and he was surprised to see that, because he's an expert on clusters, that the third biggest robotics cluster in the world is in Denmark. And the population of Denmark's six or seven million. Uh, so there's, there's knowledge and there's ideas spread throughout the world it depends on you so therefore the the key skill for leaders is to be able to sniff the good ideas out or the good ideas that will work in your business uh des let me ask you to build on that is there a region is there a country is there a part of the world that is the surprise to you in terms of really interesting ideas that are emerging that more leaders should pay attention to Gosh, um, I think I, 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 to build on Stuart's point, I, I think the moment you you make assumptions of, about a, an area being being the top of what it does, whether it's Silicon Valley, whether it's Harvard Business School, whatever it is, the, the moment you make that assumption, that's when hubris sets in, and that's that's you know the the, the best organisations and hopefully the best sort of regions recognize that and, and understand that they've always got something to learn. Um, the Nordic countries have always punched above the weight. A lot of fantastic management thinking has come out of um, Finland, come out of Sweden. Uh, Stuart mentioned Denmark. They are surprisingly um, fertile, given the populations, they are surprisingly fertile um, areas, regions, and always have been. Um, I think, you know, um, some interesting organizations in Singapore and places that you wouldn't, again, expect um, perhaps, you know, innovative organizations to come from. Mm. Um, I mean, interestingly, too, um, one of the sort of standout 
articles, if you like, in the Harvard Business Review in the last five, 10 years, which won the McKinsey Prize, was reverse innovation, which v, Vijay Govindarajan from the Tuck Business School, so an Indian, you know, Indian born professor working at a top um, Ivy League American school. And, and the point was, you know, it was moving away from the paradigm where the good ideas and the good technology was, was coming out of America and then being exported into India and just reversing that whole process. And I think the same thing will ha is happening and will happen with management ideas. You know, a bit of reverse innovation is, is what we encourage. Uh, Stuart, in our last few minutes together, I want to know something a little more personal, uh, if there is such a thing, a highlight for you personally through this pandemic. And one thing you're most looking forward to on the other side of it. I think the the, the highlight was the the event which uh, Des described uh, earlier, uh, where we we did uh, a 24 hour series of webinars to to raise money for charities at the front line of fighting fighting the virus, because that was because that was really good. And what opened my eyes there was how global it was. There was people in Papua New Guinea watching the webinars and asking questions. You think this is really fantastic because it's truly global. It's it's um, accessible to all, and everybody has got. What I like about webinars is that um, it's very democratic. In that you you will you will ask the questions. The best questions get asked. Yeah. It's not like a a conference hall room where you might have a fantastic question, but you sit, you're sitting near the back and you're miles away from the guy with the mic, and you're putting your hand up and you're ignored. I think that's that. That was a real eye opener for me. Mm. And, uh, I, think we were, I think we were fortunate too, because to, you know, to some extent, we were we were kickstarted on that by a couple of guys at Outthinker, um, Kai and Krippendorf and, and and Zach, who works with him, and and they'd stepped into the space really early, and they really they really and they got us thinking. They're a little bit younger than us too, so, and they they I think they encouraged us to get involved, and it, it was there was huge energy around that event. Love it. it. Was, Love it. Stuart, what are you most looking forward to personally on the other side of this pandemic? Uh, going to soccer matches. <laughs> Des, I hear he's a little bit of a fan. Is that true? He, he, um, yes, he has, his, um, he has his passions. He started his passions. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Des. Des, same question for you. Biggest learning uh, highlight through this pandemic for you, and what are you most looking forward to on the other side of it? Uh, biggest highlight again: the strength, the strength of the community of thinkers and, and the way that people pull together um, and connecting with people. And I think what's been great is we're doing much more of this sort of stuff, where we're actually getting to really get to know the people in the community. Um, so it's been it's been great talking to you, you know, the podcast and, and today as well. Um, we're doing our LinkedIn Live um, radar event um, every week. We're getting we're getting. We're getting to indulge our curiosity and learn about some of these great ideas. So that's been fantastic. Um, as far as when the pandemic finally lifts, um, it's got to be getting together for a Thinkers 50 gala in London and everybody in the room um, lifting the glass um, of champagne, all, you know, all dressed up in our tuxedos, I think. That's got to be the moment. On behalf of our community, I want to thank you both for your generosity, for the gift of your time, both in our podcast conversation this morning, as well as this live stream on LinkedIn and Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, for our audience, thinkers50.com is the best place for you to learn more about Des and Stuart and this truly global community of management thinkers uh, they've gathered and I, I, I feel blessed. So thank you for your friendship. Thank you for including me and my ideas in this uh, most recent Radar class. And and great to have you both. So thank you for being here. It's, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for asking us. And thank you for hosting us in such a gracious way. Great. Right, thank you very much. Good to see you both. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you thank next you. time.